You're live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India Live, India's Voice to the World. I'm Lipakshi Khurana, coming up in the next 30 minutes. Strongest criticism of Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu by US President Joe Biden as he calls his actions on Gaza a mistake, says he doesn't agree with his approach. US-Japan summit takes place later today as President Joe Biden welcomes Prime Minister Fumio Kishida visit aimed at strengthening bilateral relations in the face of growing concerns in the Indo-Pacific region. Abortion rights back in focus as Arizona's top court revives a ban on abortion under a law from 1864. President Biden blames Republicans for ripping away women's freedom. To details now, U.S. President Joe Biden said Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's actions in Gaza was a mistake and urged Israel to call for a ceasefire. In an interview to a U.S. Spanish-language TV channel, Biden calls for a ceasefire and total access to all food and medicine going into Gaza. His remarks on a ceasefire marked a shift from his previous comments in which he has said the burden lies with Hamas to agree to a truce and hostage release deal. I think what he's doing is a mistake. I don't agree with his approach. I think it's outrageous that those four, three vehicles were hit by drones and taken out on a highway where it wasn't like it was along the shore. It wasn't like there was a convoy moving here, et cetera. So I, what I'm calling for is for the Israelis to just call for a ceasefire, allow for the next six, eight weeks total access to all food and medicine going into the country. I've spoken with everyone from the Saudis to the Jordanians to the Egyptians. They're prepared to move in. They're prepared to move this food in. And I think there's, there, there, there's no excuse to not provide for the medical and the, and, the, and, the, and the food needs of those people. They should be done now. Meanwhile, an in-person meeting of Israeli and U.S. officials in the plant operation in the Gaza city of Rafah are expected next week. In communications happening every day, but as it relates to this particular conversation, when they're going to be here in person, uh, the members of the Israeli government, that's going to happen in a couple of weeks. Also, Israel says aid is moving into Gaza more quickly after international pressure to increase access. It said 468 aid trucks moved into Gaza on Tuesday following 419 on Monday. International pressure to increase access on Israel sharpened last week, including from its closest ally, the United States. White House has termed the substantial increase of aid into Gaza as good, but said is not good enough. We're talking to them about um, alternative and, uh, in our judgment, effective ways at solving a problem that needs to be solved, but doing it in a way that does not endanger uh, the, uh, the innocent. Uh, those conversations are ongoing. My expectation is that we'll see um, uh, Israeli colleagues again uh, next week uh, to, uh, to pursue that. Well, the UK joined eight other nations in an international large-scale dropping of essential aid, coinciding with the end of Ramadan. Participating countries include Jordan, Indonesia, United Arab Emirates, Netherlands, France, Germany, Egypt and the United States. Well, a shift in policy as the international community looks for a two-state solution to end the Israel-Palestinian conflict, Australian Foreign Minister Penny Wong on Tuesday said that Canberra would consider recognition of a Palestinian state. In a speech at the Australian National University, Wong backed comments by Britain's Foreign Minister David Cameron, who has said that recognizing a Palestinian state, including at the United Nations, would make a two-state solution irreversible. We are now 30 years on from the Oslo Accords. 30 years on from the Accords that put Palestinian statehood at the end of a process. 
and the failure of this approach by all parties over decades, as well as the Netanyahu government's refusal to even engage on the question of a Palestinian state, have caused widespread frustration. So the international community is now considering the question of Palestinian statehood as a way of building momentum towards a two-state solution. Recognising a Palestinian state, that one that can only exist side by side with a secure Israel, doesn't just offer the Palestinian people an opportunity to realise their aspirations, it also strengthens the force, forces for peace and it undermines extremism. While Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida will hold a summit with U.S. President Joe Biden, showcasing closer security and economic ties between the allies. Wednesday's summit is a historic upgrade in defense ties between the longtime allies in the face of China's growing might. Two leaders are expected to announce measures to enhance security cooperation to enable greater coordination and integration of forces. On Tuesday, U.S. President Joe Biden and the First Lady welcomed Japanese Prime Minister and his wife to the White House. Kishida is the fifth world leader honored by Biden with a state dinner since he took office in 2021. Kishida also addressed a roundtable on critical and emerging technologies hosted by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in Washington. He said he saw opportunities for more collaboration with the United States in next-generation computer chips. Japan welcomes investment from the United States that push forward such cooperation in critical and emerging technology. The economic growth our country obtains through your investments shall serve as a funding source of further investments into the United States by Japanese entities. Well, the Prime Minister has also been invited to address a joint meeting of Congress on Thursday. He will be just the second Japanese leader to address the body. Shinzo Abe gave a speech to Congress in 2015. And Eat India's correspondent Chris Gilbert tells us more on this. Yeah, he will very likely uh, be wanting to remind Congress of the importance to Japan to the U.S. foreign policy. Uh, you know, previous prime ministers have summed up Japan's you know, relationship to the U.S. as the spearhead of U.S. foreign policy or the unsinkable aircraft carrier ever since the formation of uh, Japanese democracy following the Second World War, uh, there has been, an, you know, a, a, a link between the U.S. Uh, and Japan that has, you know, never really been threatened. Uh, and so Kishida is very likely, very widely expected to remind Congress of, of this long-running relationship, to be a global partner together, to not rely, as Nikkei is reporting, on globalization to keep peace around the world, and that they're going to need to work together. Again, that works in Japan's interest, but it also works in the U.S. interest as well because there was a lot of investment and a lot of money at stake for that could be going into the U.S., such as the new Toyota factory uh, the EV plant uh, in North Carolina. And these are likely going to be the broad brushstrokes of his address to Congress. Well, Philippines President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. on Wednesday said the upcoming trilateral summit with U.S. and Japanese leadership will include an agreement to maintain security and freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. Talking to media, Marcos said the details of the cooperation will be discussed further when the three leaders meet in Washington on Thursday. Philippines President's upcoming visit to U.S. is a follow-up on Biden and Marcos' last meeting in 2023. And ahead of the trilateral summit, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said more joint patrols can be expected in the South China Sea in near future after drills by the United States, Australia, the Philippines and Japan last weekend. Warships from the four nations staged the exercises on Sunday following stepped-up Chinese pressure on the Philippines in the disputed strategic waterway. Sullivan also said Washington and its existing Australian and British partners in the AUKUS Security Pact would explore possible Japanese involvement in Pillar 2 of the project.
and Arizona's top court on Tuesday upheld an 1864 law that bans nearly all abortions. The Arizona Supreme Court ruled 4-2 in favor of an anti-abortion obstetrician. The court, however, also put its ruling on hold for the moment and sent the case back to a lower court to hear additional arguments. The ruling was focused on a law in the books long before Arizona achieved the statehood. It outlaws abortion from the moment of conception except when necessary to save the life of the mother and it makes no exceptions for rape or incest. Doctors prosecuted under the law could face fines and two to five years in prison. Arizona's 2022 abortion ban is extreme and hurts women. And the near total Civil War era ban that continues to hang over our heads only serves to create more chaos for women and doctors in our state. As governor, I promised I would do everything in my power to protect our reproductive freedoms. While denouncing Arizona abortion ban, the U.S. President Joe Biden said on Tuesday that millions of Arizonans will soon live under an even more extreme and dangerous ban. Biden, in a statement, said this ruling is a result of the extreme agenda of Republican elected officials who are committed to ripping away women's freedom. And voting is underway for the parliamentary polls in South Korea, voting is seen as a referendum on President Yoon suk yeol The opposition Democratic Party, which already dominates the 300-member legislature, has hammered Yoon and his conservative People Power Party for mismanaging the economy and failing to rein in inflation. PPP leader Han Dong-hoon said a big win by the DP, whose leader is facing corruption charges, would create a crisis for the country. He warned against giving the opposition an unprecedented supermajority of the 200 seats. Yoon, about to enter the third year of his five-year presidential term, has been suffering from low approval ratings for months, having come to power in 2022 vowing to cut taxes, ease business regulations and expand family support in the world's fastest aging society. And Ireland's parliament has elected Simon Harris as the country's new and youngest ever prime minister, officially taking office in Dublin to succeed Leo Varadkar following his surprising resignation last month. Harris ran unopposed to replace Varadkar as leader of the ruling Fine Gael party and the final formalities were completed in the Dale, Ireland's parliament. He has held a number of government positions since being earmarked as a rising political star in his late 20s, most recently serving as the Minister for Higher Education and Science. Harris was elected to Parliament at 24 and appointed to Cabinet before he turned 30. Before Harris, Varadkar was the country's youngest ever leader when first elected at age 38. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi congratulated Simon Harris on becoming youngest ever Prime Minister of Ireland. In a tweet he said, and I quote, highly value our historical ties that are based on shared belief in democratic values. Looking forward to work together to further strengthen India-Ireland bilateral partnership, unquote. And floods continue to create chaos across Russia and Kazakhstan with number of people evacuated rising to 100,000. Over 300 homes were flooded in the Russian city of Orenburg after the Ural River rose half a meter beyond its bursting point due to melting snow from the Ural Mountains. While in Kazakh, regions mostly bordering Russia are crossed by rivers originating in Russia, such as the Ural and the Tobol, are worst hit. The Ural is Europe's third longest river, which flows through Russia and Kazakhstan into the Caspian Sea. And I use from around the world now, Bolivian doctors are on a national strike to protest a retirement bill they claim will force them to retire when they turn 65 years old. In Bolivia, the voluntary retirement age is set at 58 years old for men and 55 years old for women, although the president of La Paz Medical College said doctors need to work longer to achieve a decent retirement pension. 
In Chile, workers from the Huachibato steel plant in the Bai Bai region protested against the suspension of steel production at their main plant. The workers are demanding that they take action to prevent the permanent closure of the plant. One of Chile's largest steel producers announced in March that it was suspending steel production at its plant in Bai Bai because it could no longer compete with imports from China. And still to come on this edition of DD India Live. Indian men's hockey team look to bounce back against Australia in the third game. Host Aussies lead the five match series 2 0. And Indian shuttlers PV Sindhu, HS Pranoy lead Indian challenge at the Badminton Asia Championships 2024 in China. And Muslims across the world celebrate the festival Eid ul Fitr India to celebrate Eid on Thursday. As India decides in the world's largest election, we help you feel the pulse of the nation. I am Sakal Bhatt. I am Shubhain Dukhosh. This election season, join us on a journey of India. Discover the colours of democracy. Watch Pool Pulse on DD India. Welcome back. You're watching DD India Live. I'm Lepak Shikuran and moving on in a tragic incident. At least 12 lives were claimed and 14 injured after a bus fell into a mine pit in central India's Durg district of Chhattisgarh on Tuesday. The bus carrying workers fell into a ditch around 8.30 in the evening. The workers belonged to a private distillery company of Durg and they were returning home when the bus met an accident. India's President Draupadi Murmu and Prime Minister Narendra Modi expressed their grief and condoled the loss of lives in an accident. Meanwhile, Chhattisgarh Deputy CM Vijay Sharma visited the injured at Ames Raipur in the wake of the accident. And now let's get to the latest on the world's largest democratic election in India. Well, election season is at its peak in India, with parties organizing multiple public meetings as the first phase of voting is slated for the 19th of this month. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is in southern state of Tamil Nadu, where he addressed a public meeting in Vellore a short while back. He said that he will continue to expose the decades-old dangerous drug mafia politics of DMK. He will also address a gathering in Methupalayam town, following which he will be visiting Maharashtra, where he will hold a meeting in Ramtek city. India's Defence Minister Rajnath Singh will be addressing public rallies in India's northern state of Uttar Pradesh. He'll be visiting Saharanpur, Bulan Sheher and Sambhal. Uttar Pradesh is one of the three Indian states along with Bihar and West Bengal which will undergo voting in seven phases. While another senior BJP leader and Union Home Minister Amit Shah will be addressing rallies in West Bengal's Balurghat and Bihar's Aurangabad. Yogi Adityanath, Chief Minister of India, State of Uttar Pradesh, is scheduled to address a rally at Katua in the northern state of Jammu and Kashmir. Voting in Jammu and Kashmir is split into five phases. And the hearing of a PIL against the use of the INDIA acronym for the opposition group International Developmental Inclusive Alliance is scheduled to be heard in Delhi's High Court on Wednesday. The Delhi High Court gave the opposition alliance a last and final opportunity over a week to reply to the PIL. Well, April 10th is being celebrated as World Homeopathy Day, a day that serves as a global platform to make people aware about the principles and benefits of homeopathic medicine. Here is a detailed report. World Homeopathy Day is celebrated on April 10th every year. The day offers an opportunity to explore and hold discussions on alternative medical systems. Homeopathic practitioners and users commemorate the day with the aim of spreading many advantages of using this alternative form of medicine. 
The goal of homeopathy is to address the whole body, including the way of life, hereditary predispositions and disease history, to give relief. Homeopathic cures are modified to take care of every individual's particular requirements. The World Homeopathy Day also underlines the importance of encouraging people to take up homeopathy as a profession. The day aims to promote evidence-based healthcare practices and also using human beings' own healing power to cure a disease. Benefits of homeopathic medicines are many. Homeopathy promotes the use of natural recovery processes for many illnesses, utilizing the body's healing power. Homeopathic remedies are generally tailored to address the root cause of the illness. Homeopathic medicines have the least side effects as they are generally made of non-toxic substances. Homeopathic treatment can easily be integrated with other medical systems, fostering a holistic path of wellness. Unlike other medicines, homeopathic pills do not hamper digestion or lower the body's resistance. World Homeopathy Day traces its roots back to the birth of Dr. Samuel Hahnemann, the founder of the alternative form of medicine. He was born on April 10, 1755. Hahnemann's idea about using highly diluted substances to stimulate the body's healing response laid the groundwork for this alternative medical system. Bureau Report, DD India. And now let's take a look at other stories making news today. A team of the Archaeological Survey of India arrived at Bhot Shala complex in Dhar, Madhya Pradesh to continue the survey which began on 22nd of March 2024. The ASI survey at Bhot Shala continues to progress, shedding light on the rich historical and cultural heritage of the region. 19 fishermen who were released from Sri Lanka prison reached Chennai airport on Wednesday. 21 fishermen from Ramanathapuram and nearby areas were arrested by the Sri Lanka Navy allegedly for cross-border fishing. Morning Aarti being performed on the second day of Navratri at Jandevana Temple on Wednesday. The first Aarti of the day at Jandevana Temple is called the Mangal Aarti. The devotees thronged the temple to offer prayers early morning. Navratra marks the beginning of Hindu New Year. You're watching the India News and now time for some sports news. In Indian Premier League, in a riveting contest, Sunrisers Hyderabad clinched the victory by a narrow margin of two runs against Punjab Kings in Mulanpur on Tuesday. Chasing 183 for a win, Punjab could only manage 180 for six. Shashank Singh top scored 46 off 25 balls and Ashutosh Sharma also remained not out on 33 off 15 balls. Well, Rajasthan Royals will square off with Gujarat Titans in Jaipur on Wednesday. Rajasthan have been unbeaten in their four matches so far. They are on top of the point stable. On the other hand, Gujarat have lost three of the five matches and are at number seven. In their previous match against Royal Challengers Bengaluru, Rajasthan Royals secured victory by six wickets with Joss Butler scoring a century and Yuzvendra Chahal taking two wickets. While Gujarat Titans in the last game against Lucknow Super Giants suffered a 33 run defeat. Rajasthan and Gujarat have played five IPL matches against each other. Rajasthan have won only one match and Gujarat secured victory in four games. Rajasthan Royals have been led brilliantly by Sanju Samson this season, while Shubman Gill has had his share of success as the new Gujarat captain. An Indian men's hockey team will take on Australia in the third game of the five-match series on Wednesday, having lost the opener 5-1 and second match 4-2. India now trail the series 2-0. The five-match series, part of India's Paris 2024 Olympic preparations, concludes on April 13th. At the Olympics, India and Australia are placed in Group B of the hockey competition. India, which won the bronze at the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, will look to change the colour of the medal this time around. And two-type Olympic medalists P.V. Sindhu and H.S. Pranoy will lead the Indian Challenge at the Badminton Asia Championships in Ningbo City of China on Wednesday. Sindhu, who is not quite at a peak performance yet, is expected to win the first round when she takes on Go Jinwei of Malaysia. Sindhu will look to get maximum points from this tournament. 
In the men's single category, Lakshya Sain's recent strong finishes at the French Open and all England championships are a positive sign. This tournament presents him with an opportunity to secure his spot at the Paris Olympics. H.S. Pranoy and Kidambi Srikant, India's other experienced campaigners, will also be competing in men's singles. And the United Arab Emirates, along with other Gulf Cooperation Council countries and many Arab nations, are celebrating Eid al-Fitr. This joyous occasion marks the conclusion of the holy month of Ramadan for millions of Muslims across the region. In India, Eid is being celebrated today across Kerala and the Union territories of Leh and Kargil. <laughs> Allah Akbar All right, that's all for this edition of DD India Live. But let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter and Instagram. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Lepakshi Kurana from all of us here in Delhi. Thanks for watching DD India Live.